Well, we are in the book of Proverbs still and again. Proverbs chapter 8, our second week there. And this is our study through the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs, so we are quickly approaching the end of this series. In fact, next week will be the last one for Proverbs. And, to, and we've done this. We've come to Proverbs, sought to learn about wisdom because our days are so strange and confusing and erratic and frustrating. And who expected what 2020 was? And who knows what 2021 holds? So we come to Proverbs for wisdom, wisdom and how to live. And we have learned so far that wisdom begins by the fear of the Lord, that we are to trust in him, in God, and acknowledge him in, in all of our ways and all that we do. Wisdom is hating the ways that are foolish, shutting our ears against voices that would lead us astray. And boy, have we heard voices that would lead us astray. And we've gone through some very challenging passages. Heard about the forbidden woman. Honestly, I'm a little bit relieved that those passages are behind us now. And instead of taking those forbidden ways, Proverbs instructs us to do good to those to whom it is due, to work diligently, to live peacefully, and to continually seek to grow in wisdom, which means that none of us are wise. None of us have arrived. We need more wisdom. We need to grow in wisdom. And so everything that I've just listed, all of these things are activities, things that mark our lives. This is, this is knowledge about wisdom that's turned into a practical way of life. Knowledge of wisdom, then without follow-through, is just foolishness. So you could read Proverbs and not be changed, and you're a fool. Honestly, I think that that's a foolishness that we're all well acquainted with. I know that I am. We're so prone to wander into folly, and we, and we need these continual reminders of what wisdom is, of wisdom's value, of how essential wisdom is to all the workings of reality and human flourishing and what is favorable to God. And so last week, Josiah, Josiah Stevens, who just led us in worship, brought us before Lady Wisdom, where we could hear her call. So we, we could hear what God has to say about wisdom for us and how it applies to our life through these three different appeals. And I'm so grateful for Josiah, for his passion for the Word, for the way that he faithfully presents it, that there are men like Josiah in this body of believers. What a gift of God to this church. It's so helpful for me to be surrounded by such by such folk. So, brother, thank you. And thank you all for listening and learning and receiving the word um, as it was presented last week. So as Josiah walked us through the first 21 verses of Proverbs chapter 8, we were reminded of this incredible value of, of wisdom, and this attribute of God that is personified by a beautiful, alluring woman named Lady Wisdom. And from the heights of those verses, which Josiah took us to, Josiah took us to, we learned what she beckons us into. We heard her voice. And then we come to verse 22 in Proverbs chapter 8, and things shift. Things take a turn. And then she begins, Lady Wisdom begins hearkening back to times more ancient than any human mind can conceive. So if you're looking at the manuscript right now, I, I apologize for accidentally not telling you uh, what the purpose of this message is, <laughs> but we will hear her say and tell us that the antiquity of wisdom is what gives her such value and authority. And then we're going to push aside the curtain of this metaphor of lady wisdom and see what is really going on with God, in God, in creation, for us? And then how are we supposed to respond to God's wisdom in creation? So that's, those are three things that we're going to do today. We're going to 
understand that the antiquity of wisdom is what gives her such value and authority. We're going to look behind the curtain of the metaphor to see what's really happening. And then we're going to talk about how we are supposed to respond to God's wisdom in creation. So let's read the passage. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 through 36. I'm reading from the ESV. Would you follow along? The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up, at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth, before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the foundations of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man." And now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. Let's pray. Oh God, we are in need of wisdom. As we are every Sunday, as we are in every moment, we need wisdom. Wisdom from you, not from this world, not from our own understanding, from you. And so by your spirit, Lord, would you reveal to us wisdom. Show us your mind. Show us your heart. Give to us the things that are spiritually discerned. And I pray that in each one of us, rejoicing would begin welling up. A delight in you that is fresh and new would be experienced. That is where you take us with wisdom, right into enjoyment of you. So would all of us know joy in you today as we Consider and meditate upon your word. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Lady Wisdom is doing something that no mortal can do. Indeed, not even the angelic host can do what she's doing right here. She's going back to the very beginning of all beginnings. Before God had sprung space-time into existence out of nothing before heaven was filled with the angelic, before cherubim and seraphim, before all, back to a moment when all that existed was triune bliss. Lady Wisdom takes us deep, deep into the vast primordial past. Look at verse 22 again. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. So right off of the bat, we stumble into this really tricky territory. We probably didn't even realize it. Out of that verse in this passage arose heresies in the church through the centuries. Because there's a really tricky interpretation of verse 22. It's been hotly debated through the millennia. So verse 22, the Hebrew word is kwana which is translated in the ESV as possessed. If you're reading the NIV, it's brought forth. Elsewhere, it's translated as acquired or created. So regardless of how you translate that, the context of this passage is telling us about the birth of wisdom. We need to remember that this is a metaphor. Lady wisdom is, is an attribute of God. Right? Wisdom is an attribute of God. So... As an attribute of the eternal God, how could wisdom begin? 
Did God have a beginning? Did wisdom have a beginning? We're going to circle back around to this question. Before I answer it, we need to consider what Solomon is doing as he writes these words for us by placing wisdom at the beginning, at the beginning of all beginnings. The first half of Proverbs 8, as is the first half of Proverbs 8, so is the second half. Wisdom is incomparably precious. More than all that you could desire on earth, as Josiah talked about last week, more than the sum of humanity could desire is the value of wisdom. The antiquity of wisdom is precisely what makes her so valuable. The fact that she is most ancient of all created things. There is no one who is as wise as the one who has seen it all. Only the one who has experienced all things is able to offer the wisest and most authoritative counsel. And this is, this is sort of the biblical pattern. The one who has the most experience is the wisest. And so we are told to stand and rise as the gray head passes us by. And I'm getting closer. So conversely, Job's friends derided him because he did not have the kind of experience that Lady Wisdom has. Job 15, 7 through 9 says, Are you the first man who was brought forth? Or were you brought forth before the hills? Have you listened to the counsel of God? And do you limit wisdom for yourself or to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not clear to us? So they're essentially mocking Job because he wasn't around before all things. So he could not speak authoritatively, wisely. Now their mocking wasn't justified, but you can understand the principle behind it. There is something about wisdom that can only be possessed through a great vastness of experience. Lady wisdom, more ancient than all created things, possesses, therefore, the highest wisdom. She has seen it all. So if anyone has authority to speak on the nature of wisdom, on the nature of anything, it's her. And then there is this expose of her antiquity written for us in three segments. First, the time before all things were created. And then the time during the creation. And then the response to creation. So let's look at that first part before creation in verses 23 through through 26. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields or the first of the dust of the world. So again, we're seeing the birth of wisdom, or more precisely, the begetting of wisdom. And so Lady Wisdom here is not claiming to be eternal. but She's saying that something happened to her, something outside of her. He who is eternal knit her together, formed her, begot her, and brought her forth. And then, and then came everything else. That's a critical understanding for where we're going. First her, then all. So without a doubt, as we read those verses, Solomon is not giving us a 21st century scientific explanation of the creation. What we're reading is is really this ancient Near East tradition of the world and its created order. But notice how Solomon moves from the depths to the heights, goes from lower to higher, from depths to springs to mountains. And really these mountains in this tradition are like the foundations of the earth, the the pillars that hold up the earth. So the mountains to the hills, which are higher, to the field and soil. And the field of soil is the domain of humanity. That's where we live. And so you can see all of this is building up to our home. And there she was, Lady Wisdom, before all of that. And then in reverse order, 
collapsing down chiastically from heights to depths, the creator begins his work. Verse 27, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the foundations of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth. So she watched as it was built, layer upon layer, until there was a suitable environment for, for the image bearers. You see, she's watching, right? She's not an active agent in this creation. She's an observer. It was God who fashioned the plans. It was God who did all the work. Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters into the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. And all scripture testifies that God, by God's command, the universe, the earth, even us, were brought into existence by his word, by his command. Out of nothing, everything. And there's wisdom watching it, seeing it all happen, layer by layer, word by word. What's so fascinating as God's creating, this is one of the most profound things that wisdom is showing us here, is that all of this was given order. Just as man was given law, so is the physical world. Creations, all creations, were given law. So God established limits so that his created order might not transgress his command. Doesn't that sound legal? Doesn't that sound mosaic? We can clearly see the very nature, the very, um, very fabric of nature depends upon obeying the laws of God. And wisdom watched as God created what is beautiful and wild and dangerous and delicate, each one completely free to be what they are so long as they obey the order which the Creator has given them. And as it is for nature, so it is for man. And now we come to a response of creation. And Lady Wisdom is able to plumb the depths of creation and in them see the very words of God. In everything, in all created things, she is seeing God's command alive and in action, sustaining all things, upholding all things. And how can she not then turn in worship and in joy? It's like her heart is deluged by delight. Verse 30. Then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. Again, there's a lot of debate about what this particular verse means. The ESV and the NIV read very differently. I I think if you're looking at the NIV, it totally omits the phrase master workman or any language like that. Who is the master workman that's being discussed here? The language even in the Hebrew is quite ambiguous. But for the first time in the passage, it seems perhaps that Lady Wisdom has a hand, an active role in the created order. But we know that God is the master craftsman. It's not her. She's not even real. And yet she is the delight of God. She, Wisdom, is is the delight of God. And in return, she, wisdom, delights in God. What's going on there? This is an attribute. What is going on? So it's time that we push aside this curtain 
and look beyond the metaphor and begin to understand how the fabric of reality was woven together for us. There's something incredibly deep and profound happening. And, and we come to the question again, how can wisdom be created? Remember again the nature of wisdom. Knowledge is in the mind. Wisdom is practical. Wisdom is action. Wisdom is when good knowledge turns into good activity. In other words, it takes action for there to be wisdom. I love this quote that Josiah used last week, and I'm stealing it, by A.W. Tozer. Wisdom, among other things, is the ability to devise perfect ends and to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. That is so profound. It sees the end from the beginning so that there can be no need to guess or conjecture. Wisdom sees everything in focus, each in proper relation to all, and thus able to work toward predestined goals with flawless precision. Perfect knowledge, which only God possesses, can see all things through all time perfectly. He knows all ends and all possible ends, and he works all things together for what he deems is right and perfect. But in terms of what God has created in our universe, there was a first action, a first work. With that first action, Wisdom in the created order was born, was revealed, was brought forth. Lady Wisdom is therefore not the master craftsman. God is. Lady Wisdom is the tool which God used. The, th- <clears throat> the thread woven through every stitch of creation. When God acted, when he spoke, let there be Wisdom was woven into that, like the instrument on which he played those notes. And with every stitch of his masterful tapestry, God delighted in it, both in what he had created and the wisdom in which he created it. Like God is glorying in his wisdom as he sees his created order. Genesis 1.31, and God saw everything that he had made, everything, and behold, it was very good. Psalm 104.31, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. God is rejoicing in his works. Why? Why does God take pleasure in his works? Because his works proclaim his glory and his wisdom. And I love Psalm 148 for this. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him all the heights. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all you shining stars. Praise him you the highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. Praise him. Again, God delights in what he created, because in creation is the revelation of the creator, his signature on every atom. On every galaxy is his name. And it shows just how masterful, just how wise he truly is. So if somebody is a, a painter and you want to know how good they are, then you look at their painting and you will know immediately. Somebody says that they can sing, well, listen to them sing and you will know. Likewise, Creation reveals the glory and the wisdom of God in its perfect intricacy, in its power, in how all things are interwoven. 
and yet we have not spoken of God's greatest work in creation, the work in which he takes the greatest delight in verses 30 and 31. Then I was beside him like a master workman. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. Again, we see that God created the universe to be inhabited. That's not what the world tells you. The depths, the springs, the mountains, the fields, the heavens, all of that is so that mankind could have a home. God has made for us a home. Why? So that we could look at his created order. So that we could behold it. And see his wise workings in our lives. And stand in awe of him. And rejoice. We were created to see the works of his hand. And to worship him. When we live by this command. We are truly alive. Let's say that again. We are created to see the works of his hand and worship him. That's like the command that we are given as humans. And when we live by this command, we are truly alive. We know abundant life. And last week, as I was in the mountains, I got to experience a taste of this and revel in the glory and the wisdom of our creator. And so there's this beautiful, deep snow that softens and muffles terrain that's rugged and wild, and white mountains that disappear off into the horizon, and sunsets that turn lakes into tongues of fire and make the mountains blush, and rime ice on these twigs and branches that look like thousands of tiny little daggers, and it is gorgeous, and it is stunning. I feel like the best you can do is take a picture, which is silliness. It's all created so I would worship, so we would worship and rejoice in our creator, stand in awe of him. How can he do this? How can our hearts not be turned to worship when the master craftsman puts on such lavish displays of his wisdom? John Calvin writes, There is not one blade of grass and there is no color in this world that is not intended to make us rejoice. I wonder if there's anything that you might see on your drive home today that would cause you to rejoice in the Creator. And finally, there's one more work that we have not spoken of, we must speak of. It is the mightiest display of the wisdom of God. As Paul wrote, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The eternal Son of God, begotten by the Father, entered into creation as a man. And he who is all wise died like a shameful fool in the place of fools so that fools could be made wise. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Jesus Christ is to be our mightiest boast as humans. So if the greatest works of wisdom wrought by the hand of God are seen in Jesus Christ, then must he not be our greatest delight, our greatest joy, our greatest pleasure? Wouldn't that make Jesus, loving Jesus, delighting in Jesus, the wisest thing conceivable? Wouldn't that make Jesus the reason for existence, all existence? Indeed, in the Greek, in John 1.1, 1, 1, we read that Jesus is the logos, often translated as the word. But there's a lot more depth to that word. It really means the reason. The reason that undergirds all reality. 
Jesus is the reason for all creation. Not only is he the reason for creation, but he is also the active agent in that creation, the source of creation. As John writes in chapter 1, verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The atoms at the center of galaxies undiscovered, a pod of whales that is currently chasing down a school of fish somewhere way off in the Pacific, the coronavirus, your very life, all of it exists because of Jesus and for Jesus and through Jesus and by Jesus. All of it is so that the wisdom of God and the power of God can be seen in the Son of God who faced the wrath of God for fools such as us and in so doing redeemed the creation of God. All of this was according to his eternally wise plan. Jesus is the reason. Jesus is the fountainhead of all wisdom. And unlike Lady Wisdom, he is very real. Unlike Lady Wisdom, he is eternal. Unlike Lady Wisdom, he is the creator. But let let us return once more to Lady Wisdom and read her final words in chapter 8. Look at verses 32 through 36 with me. And now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. I think if you've been a part of this series, you probably hear the voice of the Father right there. There's a unity in the voices of Lady Wisdom and the Father instructing his son. They both address their sons or the sons. And they are calling Lady Wisdom and the Father, they are calling the sons to this immediate and pressing need. Hear instruction. Listen to me. Watch. Wait. Find me. It is literally a matter of life and death. They are calling to us. Listen. Hear. Do not delay. The greatest of care must be given to not miss the call of wisdom, to not turn aside and fail to find her. Failure to find her is to hate her. Theologian Michael V. Fox writes, those who hate wisdom are not just stupid, they are depraved. Though they may not realize it, down deep they love, they love not the life that flows from wisdom, but death itself. <laughs> As Josiah put it so aptly last week, God is the subject of the story. We, we his creatures, most certainly are not. And yet how prone are we to try to revolve the sun around us, to make this world about us? If we ever think we are the subject of the story, and if this world ever does begin to revolve around us, we are the fools who are injuring themselves. Wisdom is calling you to lift your eyes from your brief and foolish life and gaze upon the master craftsman, the craftsman who became a part of his craft, the one who died so that you could rejoice in him, the one who works all things together for the good of those who love him. And if anyone knows what they are talking about, it's God. He's seen it all. He formed it all. The call of Lady Wisdom is his call. And so we are reading here in Proverbs chapter 8, in this whole book, the words of our Creator to us. 
Does that astound you? He is both the subject and the author. He is our maker and our judge, the ultimate and final authority, the greatest counselor, the source of all wisdom. And so we must urgently heed his words. Our lives are a breath, are a moment, are nothing. To delay one day is to injure yourself, is to love death. Let us delight not in created things, but in the one who has created it all. Let us rejoice in the cross of Christ, which is the thunderclap of the wisdom of God. And this, brothers and sisters, all these things that we've just surveyed, it is not intellectual data. It is not meant to stay only in your mind. You are meant to live this, to look around every day, no matter the weather and no matter your mood, and praise God for the wonder of his creation. Even out these windows are glories to behold. That is wisdom, to see in the trees and the snow and the sun and the sky the glory of God. And then we think of Jesus, who humbled himself to the point of death, And we give glory to our Father in heaven that he would take the foolish things of the world and make them wise. We must remember how infinitesimally small our lives are and lean not on our own understanding. Oh, blessed is the one who listens to wisdom. For whoever finds her finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Let's pray. God, we are in awe of you. By your hand, all things were created, and by your hand, they all are held together. Even us, even this breath I draw is from you. We praise you. We honor you, our creator. And we thank you that though we have fallen and corrupted everything around us, that you have taken us so foolish and made us wise as we behold the cross of Christ and in Jesus see salvation, see life, see forgiveness. Thank you for these gifts, unfathomably valuable. I pray that our hearts would burst in joy all the more as we behold them today and throughout our week, throughout our lives. Let these things not just be stored up in our minds, but mark our lives entirely. I pray that in in his name, our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.